In 1938, Ducks Unlimited Canada began protecting and restoring Canada's wetlands. Today, our work is more critical than ever. Our science shows wetlands give us clean water, they store carbon, and they help offset the impacts of our changing climate. Protecting wetlands protects us all. Our wetlands, our future. A message from Ducks Unlimited Canada. Good morning, everybody. Uh, and thank you for coming in today to watch the, uh, to check out this event. Um, <clears throat> uh, we're happy to have you with us here today on World Water Day as we share the results of a new research project on the power of small wetlands. Uh, my name is Kyle Borrowman. I'm a biologist with Ducks Unlimited Canada here in Ontario. And for the past 83 years, our organization has been conserving wetlands across the country. Whether you're into fishing, hunting, hiking, canoeing, bird watching, or any other uh, event that you find yourself out in our wetlands, uh, they do uh, provide uh, wildlife the support they need and are incredible, valuable resources. <clears throat> They're some of the most powerful ecosystems on the planet, and they help keep our water clean, our communities safe from floods and droughts, and mitigate the effects of our changing climate. And today we're happy to share some of the results of the new research on nutrient retention capacity of small wetlands in agricultural landscapes. As part of today's program, we're pleased to welcome a number of special guests, including scientists and conservation experts from Ducks Unlimited on both sides of the border, uh, who will join with us to share wetland research and discuss conservation efforts that are helping address some of today's biggest environmental issues. Uh, so while I wish we were out on the beautiful shores of Lake Erie right now, uh, watching as the migrating birds are uh, beginning to make their way back to Canada's wetland breeding grounds, uh, unfortunately, we've come accustomed to a meeting like this in this uh, virtual setting. With that, I do have a few housekeep housekeeping items that I'm going to run through quickly. <clears throat> so first of all, we just ask that all participants please keep your microphone muted during the presentations to eliminate background noise, uh, as well uh, to improve network quality for those who may have slower connections. Uh, we ask that you please keep your cameras off during the presentation. <clears throat> But uh, with that said, it doesn't mean we don't want to hear from you. At the end of today's presentations, we will have a dedicated uh, question and answer session uh, where our speakers can answer all of your questions. Also, please be advised that today's event is being recorded uh, and that recording will be available for viewing in the coming days. Uh, we'll be sure to share a link uh, with that with a following up, uh, uh, following email, follow up email, sorry. Um, so first off, I'd just like to start today's event with a land acknowledgement. Um, <clears throat> so although we, we find ourselves geographically dispersed here in this online environment, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we're on the meeting, that we're meeting on the traditional lands of Indigenous peoples and First Nation communities. And as we work towards reconciliation, Ducks Unlimited recognizes the land rights of all the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, and Mississauga people within the various treaties of Southern Ontario. We invite you to honor Indigenous history and culture and acknowledge the territories and treaty lands in your local areas as well. And now for the formal part of the program. Uh, as you know, Canada and the United States under the Binational Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement have targeted phosphorus reduction for Lake Erie. Uh, as part of Ducks Unlimited's large-scale conservation program uh, in the watershed, scientists are measuring the ability of small wetlands to remove nutrients uh, from the water before it moves downstream. After two years of research, science is expanding our understanding and is helping to quantify how wetland restoration can uh, support phosphorus reduction targets for Lake Erie. Led by DUC's Institute for Wetland and Waterfowl Research, this new research was funded in partnership with the Government of Canada via the Great Lakes Protection Initiative. And please join me in welcoming our first guest speaker on behalf of the Government of Canada, Jennifer Vincent. Thank you very much and hello everybody. Uh, greetings from Environment and Climate Change Canada and of course, happy World Water Day. Uh, as we can all appreciate, the Great Lakes are really a precious natural resource. And I just wanna share some basic facts with folks here today. They hold about one fifth of the world's fresh water surface, surface fresh water supply. Um, they're one of the most ecologically diverse ecosystems on the planet. They are home to 40 million plus people. And in Canada, 
economically, the Great Lakes St. Lawrence region generates about $7.9 trillion Canadian annually and supports about 51 million jobs. So this region is not only economically significant, but it also provides a source of safe drinking water to millions of Canadians and is a culturally significant region to our First Nations and Métis communities. So the protection of this important resource was why Canada and the United States committed in 1972, and then again, actually in 2012, to protect the Great Lakes through the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. This year, 2022, marks the 50th anniversary of the signing of the original Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. And that is an important occasion uh, to, for, that allows us to reflect on the achievements made but also to recognize that we're not done yet and there's ongoing challenges that we need to continue to address to ensure that this resource is here and flourishing and sustainable for future generations. One of those ongoing challenges is excessive loads of phosphorus. These loads can trigger harmful and nuisance algal blooms and lead to the development of hypoxia when those algae decompose. But you know, this isn't the first time we've had this challenge. Algae were a major problem in the Great Lakes in the 1970s and mandated improvements to wastewater treatment and limits on phosphorus contents and detergents did seem to fix the issue. However, the problem reemerged again in the early 1990s, largely due to urban and agricultural land use intensification and climate change. The negative effects of harmful and nuisance algal blooms and hypoxia are mo seen most severely in the Lake Erie system and increasingly affect nearshore areas in Lake Ontario, as well as Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. In Lake Erie, phosphorus promotes that, that creates the development of these hazardous algal bloom and contributes to hypoxia. They've actually estimated that it's costing the Canadian economy about $272 million annually. So under the Water Quality Agreement in 2016, Canada and the US set new phosphorus reduction targets Canada subsequently committed to reducing our loadings by 40%, which is about 212 metric tons to the central basin and as well loadings from the Thames River watershed and the Leamington County tributary watersheds. How are we doing this? Well, we've created the Canada Ontario Lake Erie Action Plan known as the LEAP, which details over hundred actions to reduce phosphorus loads and to minimize those impacts from algae. So Ducks Unlimited Canada is a really important partner in the delivery of this plan because small wetlands are an important factor that we need to address to achieve that 40% reduction. As important regulators of water quality and quantity, when small wetlands are lost, those watersheds lose the ability to hold heavy amounts of precipitation uh, and that contributes to downstream flooding and increased volumes of those harmful nutrients. So these small wetlands are important landscape features, features that essentially function as natural infrastructure by capturing and storing phosphorus runoff from agricultural land and thus reducing the risk of harmful blooms in receiving waters. So Ducks Unlimited, as mentioned, received funds through Environment Canada's Great Lakes Protection Initiative, and they have been doing some really important work to increase our understanding on how well these small wetlands perform and what, how effective they are in actually reducing nutrient loadings. So today is a really wonderful opportunity for them to share this new knowledge with us and, and to allow us to ask questions and have discussion and to be able to continue to make that important progress towards a healthy and sustainable Great Lakes. I'm super excited about today's agenda and the discussion that follows and I wanna thank you very much for all coming today. Thanks so much, uh, Jennifer. And, and just to kind of back up a little bit too, um, we, we didn't share some of your credentials as well and some of the experience that you've had. So I uh, just wanted to put this in here. Uh, Jennifer joined the Environment and Climate Change Canada, uh, in, joined Environment and Climate Change Canada in September 1998 and is currently the manager of the Great Lakes Harmful Pollutant Section. In, in the Ontario Regional uh, Director's Office. So she's responsible for the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement uh, nutrient and chemical, uh, chemicals management programs, as well as uh, the nutrient management program for the Lake of the Woods Basin. And uh, we, we really appreciate you being here today, Jennifer, and thank you for the kind words. And thanks again for the financial support on this project. Uh, DUC and, and the Government of Canada have had a long history of working together, and it's um, an honor to recognize this important investment. So next, I'd like to turn things over to one of my colleagues here in Ontario uh, with Ducks Unlimited. It's uh, Owen Steele. O Owen is uh, going to provide us with 
uh, some background on the agricultural landscape in the Lake Erie watershed and to share more about DUC's wetland conservation program and its important geographic region. As the head of conservation programs, Owen works with an enthusiastic team of biologists, engineers, and support staff to deliver the, and manage Ducks Unlimited's conservation programs across the province of Ontario. With over 30 years of experience in the field, Owen also provides leadership to DUC's conservation planning and science, uh, science program, highlighted by research in the field of waterfowl ecology and wetland ecosystem services. As Owen will share, understanding and promoting the potential of wetlands to function as natural green infrastructure and contribute to climate change adaptation is seen as a key conservation strategy for the future of waterfowl habitats in Ontario. Please welcome me in joining, and join, please join me in welcoming Owen. Hey, thanks, Kyle. Good morning, everybody. Um, well, spring has definitely arrived and, and we're blessed here in Southern Ontario to currently have lots of water on the landscape, unlike many places uh, in the world uh, that aren't so fortunate. I was home to my parents' farm just this uh, past weekend and there was an abundance of sheet water uh, in all the fields and there was lots of tundra swans taking full advantage of, of that uh, water to rest and recover before their next uh, push northward. And I'm certain that uh, they too are celebrating uh, World Water Day with us uh, today as they frolic in that uh, abundant water. Ducks Unlimited Canada has been conserving wetlands and other natural uh, spaces for waterfowl, wildlife and people for more than 80 years. Um, since 1974, Ducks has completed more than 5,000 uh, conservation projects here in Ontario, all uh, together conserving more than 1 million acres of natural habitat. <laughs> I actually didn't think my career would be long enough to see that 1 millionth acre, uh, but I've been proven uh, wrong uh, just this past year. This is especially significant in a province that has lost 80% or more of its wetlands in the southern part of the landscape. So some, surely something to uh, celebrate. As part of a charity, I work with a small team of uh, passionate biologists and engineers who implement our wetland conservation program. This past year, we completed over 140 uh, wetland projects, 140 of them. Uh, with almost 50 of them being in the Lake Erie watershed. These projects range from the reflooding of drain wetlands using small earthen dams and water control structures to restore far, former wetland hydrology, to the creation of small wetlands in low areas or on marginal farmland. The commonality with all these wetlands is that they serve to hold runoff and rainfall, as Jennifer pointed out, um, holding that water on the landscape and giving the wetlands the opportunity to retain nutrients that might otherwise be released downstream. Our success wouldn't be possible though if it wasn't for the collaboration of conservation authorities and other local conservation groups that bring much needed leverage funding and capacity to that cause. Even more so, this accomplishment wouldn't be possible without the enthusiasm and conservation ethic of private landowners, uh, like the ones you'll be introduced to today, who have embraced wetlands on their properties. One of the things that I appreciate uh, most about working with ducks is our conservation programs are based on and guided by sound science. Almost 20 years ago, we completed a four-year waterfowl ecology research project here in Ontario that set the stage for the wetland conservation programs that uh, you see here today in southwestern Ontario that we're delivering. True to our mandate, that research ensured that what we were doing on the landscape was ducky. Um, but as societal and environmental uh, interests broadened, so did the understanding of the co-benefits that wetlands provide us all. Uh, duck science followed these interests, whether they be related to species at risk inhabiting our wetland projects, what wetlands can do to mitigate flooding associated with extreme weather events, 
how wetlands sequester carbon to help us adapt to a, a changing climate, or as we are here today to learn about the role that wetlands play in keeping our lakes and rivers clean. This science is key not only to ensuring that we're doing the right things in the right places, but it also helps us improve our conservation programs, making them more efficient and effective. The overall goal of the study that we will share with you today was to quantify how wetlands retain nutrients under different hydrological conditions. The study focused on small, on eight small uh, wetlands that were less than seven years post restoration and all located in southwestern Ontario's agricultural landscape. The eight wetlands were all on private lands and can be described as edge of field sites set in low lying areas that receive runoff from the agricultural landscape. And now we'd like to share a short video that showcases these important wetland habitats and recognizes the landowners who allowed their wetland restoration projects to be monitored as part of the wetland research project. Thanks, Kyle. Great little video. I hope uh, hope everyone enjoyed that. Um, and thank you, Owen, for giving an overview of uh, some of the hard work that we're doing here in Ontario. Um, <clears throat> so with that video, I think it does a really good job of highlighting some of those behind the scenes efforts that our, our team and our landowners, um, uh, kind of the efforts that they go through in order to collect the data. Uh, so while Brian's going to dig into the graphs, tables and reports of the, the project, which do a great job of outlining the results of the work, um, they often don't capture the physical, mental, and sometimes emotional lift that comes with capturing each one of those individual measurements, water samples, and data points. And, uh, you know, it's a, a lot of collective work over, um, you know, over two years in this sense. And that said, we're excited to have Elise Gabrielli with us today, uh, who did much of that boots on the ground work this past year. Um, Elise uh, <clears throat> has, uh, had received a Master's of Science uh, from the University of Waterloo's Hydrometeorology Research Group. Uh, her research was focused on climatic and environmental controls on peatland ecology and their functioning uh, within the Fort McMurray, Alberta area, and she was part of the Suncor Energy Pilot FEN research team. Uh, Elise joined our Small Wetland Research Project in 2020 as our field research contractor. In this role, Elise provided technical expertise to facilitate sampling, 
Um, she performed all the data collection and kept the sites functioning as well as setting up and maintaining field equipment. Elise also served as our in-person contact to help build our relationships uh, with the landowners and our project partners. Uh, please help uh, welcome Elise as she shares a few words of her experience on this project. Perfect. Thank you so much, Kyle. And hello, everyone. So as mentioned, I joined the project at the end of 2020. I was immediately captivated by the nature of this research and knew I wanted to be involved in some capacity. Over the 2021 monitoring year, it was my absolute pleasure to work alongside the DUC staff, as well as the outstanding project partners. What most captivated me was getting to know each of the landowners on a personal level and better understanding their story. Some are longtime residents of the area with properties that have spanned generations and have bared witness to tremendous change. While others have lived and worked in various parts of the province. But a common thread uniting them all, they are true stewards of the land. They understand their integral role to protect and preserve their land as a vital resource and improve the health and connectivity of the larger ecosystem in which they reside. Through countless conversations, I learned that this project was often just one of many that they're involved with. Many serve on stewardship councils or volunteer for like-minded organizations. They have designed and planted pollinator pathways or dedicated other portions of their land to rehabilitation projects. This passion and dedication was evident through their genuine commitment to the project. Frigid temperatures and heavy rain events did not deter them from coming out to greet me with a warm hello and offering assistance in any way they could. Whether that be an offer of a ride to help bring my load of equipment to the monitoring locations, loaning me the own, their own equipment and supplies, thoughtfully providing condition updates when I was not on site, which often included the latest bird and waterfowl sighting, going out of their way to clear a path to provide ease of access to the monitoring points. And of course, providing offers of food and water to ensure I was well equipped to handle some of the long sampling days. The project partners are truly unique giving of their time and their land. They see the value of these wetland units and are dedicated to making a difference. Thank you does not begin to express my sheer gratitude for the relationships I've developed over the past year. And I know I speak for the entire DUC staff when I say the success of the project would not be possible without the amazing, amazing support of the landowners. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Elise. And again, thank you to all our landowners, uh, some of who are uh, noticed are joining us today as well. Uh, and Elise, and, and really the work couldn't have been done without your uh, your hard effort, hard work and efforts and and uh, skill set as well. It was, um, you know, uh, definitely a, a major um, benefit for us uh, having you on this project. Um, and so with our, our landowners, again, thanking them uh, for allowing uh, your wetland restoration projects to be monitored as part of this project. Uh, there's a lot of kindness and trust that was shown towards DUC staff and partners. And um, having that access to your private land frequently uh, was truly gracious. <clears throat> so this brings us to the point of our program where we're excited to invite Brian Page. Uh, Brian is the uh, lead researcher on this project, and he's going to share a presentation outlining the details of the study and uh, results demonstrating the nutrient retention capacity of small wetlands in a range of conditions over multiple years. Brian was hired by Ducks Unlimited Canada in 2008 as a biologist, uh, working with the Institute of Wetland and Waterfowl Research. 
Here he was responsible for coordinating water quality and water quantity research activities on watersheds across the Canadian prairies. Uh, since 2012, Brian has been a research biologist conducting research to conduct, uh, sorry, to uh, understand the behavior of intact, restored and drained wetlands on water quality and water quantity. Brian completed his bachelor's of science at the University of Manitoba with a major in environmental science where his coursework focused on aquatic chemistry and freshwater ecology. He completed his master's of science at the University of Manitoba, working with an aquatic chemist investigating spe metal speciation across the sediment water interface of wetlands in Manitoba, Ontario, and Quebec. Uh, and welcome, Brian. Okay, well, thank you for that, Kyle. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, the title of my talk this morning is The Nutrient Retention Capacity of Newly Restored Wetlands in Southwestern Ontario. I'd like to acknowledge uh, Parsiminian, an engineer I work with, and Owen Steele, who was involved with this project from the very start. Uh, I won't go into the background what that Jennifer captured uh, when she talked, but it's been proposed that wetlands can be used as natural infrastructure to reduce non-point source pollution associated with agricultural runoff. So as uh, Owen said, our goal is to assess the ability of newly restored wetlands to filter nutrients from agricultural runoff and provide a quantitative value to determine if wetland restoration should be implemented as a best management practice to help protect Lake Erie water quality. I'll just briefly touch on wetland loss in Southern Ontario. Um, where we did, our, uh, in 2010, Dexalmo Canada did a study to assess the wetland loss through Southern Ontario. And where we conducted this study in Southwestern Ontario, we see that the wetland loss ranges from 65, maybe up to 100%. And that's when we're talking about Lake Erie receiving non-point source uh, nutrients. There's few wetlands left to intercept that water coming up across, out of either a forest or a field before it hits that stream to deliver those nutrients to Lake Erie. <clears throat> so our project objectives were to measure the massive nutrients that are retained in newly restored wetlands. The specific metric that uh, we want to look for is the phosphorus retention capacity. So that would be the mass of phosphorus in kilograms retained per hectare of wetland in one year. So we did this project over two water years. A water year, in case you don't know, is defined from October 1st to September 30th. So we did this from 2018 to 2019, and again in 2020 to 2021. Uh, when doing this project, we wanted to determine the retention capacity for all phosphorus and all nitrogen species. This is one of the data gaps that exists in the science literature right now that lots of these projects might report total phosphorus and total nitrogen. Uh, maybe it's because uh, a grad student was analyzing the, the samples themselves. And it's, uh, it's a reality that uh, water chemistry is actually pretty expensive. So not all researchers can, can do this. Um, so specifically, we were looking at total phosphorus, total dissolved phosphorus, soluble reactive phosphorus, and particulate phosphorus. Now, something to point out, Soluble reactive phosphorus is the most bioavailable form of phosphorus to algae in an aquatic ecosystem. So this phosphorus, it's not bound to any particulate, it's not bound to any ligand, it's not bound to organic matter, it's free flowing phosphorus that's easily incorporated into the cell of an, of an algal species. And this is one of the the loading of phosphorus to Lake Erie uh, since 2000 is the, the proportion of soluble reactive phosphorus has increased over this time. So this is an important thing to, for us to look at. So to do this, essentially, we want to measure the flow of water into a wetland. So that'll be measured as a volume cubic meters. We take chemistry samples, the concentration, multiply those together and we get our mass in. We do the same thing to the outflow to get the mass out. And our mass retained is essentially the mass in minus the mass out. We did this at eight newly restored wetlands across Southwestern Ontario. These locations are in the red dots there. They uh, 
these sites sort of had to be close together because we wanted to visit them once a week, if not twice a week during periods of high flow. So we did end up uh, concentrating these sites more on in, in watersheds that deliver either to uh, central Lake Erie or western Lake Erie, which works well because that's where the main water quality um, difficulties are arising with Lake Erie. The average age of these wetlands were about four years old. These are small wetlands, about 0.34 hectares in size, and they have wide, they actually have a quite a range in contributing area, which works quite well. So a uh, range from 2.2 to up to 63 hectares for an average contributing area of 16.4. These are all located at the edge of a field. I like to point out that none of these are floodplain restorations. We want to stay away from a uh, wetland system that had a lot of groundwater interactions. We weren't, we didn't want to, we weren't confident in quantifying that too well. We were, we had to have landowner agreements for the sites that we were picking. All these wetlands are flow through wetlands, so they all have outflow infrastructure. And the uplands are also into corn, soybeans, winter wheat, and there's one site that is uh, hay grasslands. To give you an idea about what these sites look like, here's two pictures of two of our research sites. On the left is site LL. It's a shallow basin, sort of a kidney bean shaped, and you can see on the distance there the agricultural fields that contribute to this wetland. Whereas on the right hand side, site DY, this wetland is tucked down below beneath some, some pines on the right, and this wetland will receive the overland runoff coming down from behind those pines around and then coming down towards it from that snow covered field on the end. There's a small little tile drain as well and it will drain off to the outflow to the left. For basin bathymetry, we performed overland and wetland bed surveys to develop elevation storage curves. And for the contributing area, we used LIDAR data from the province of Ontario using an ArcGIS tool. And one site we used the Ontario flow assessment tool. We monitor the, the inflows and outflows with area velocity flow sensors. There's a close up picture right in the middle there. So inside that sensor, there's a pressure trans transducer. So that'll measure the depth of the water above it. It uses Doppler technology to measure the velocity of water going over it. Uh, the software we use, we plug in the diameter of the culvert and it gives us a flow rate every 15 minutes. Uh, to make sure those are working properly, once or twice a week, we measured uh, flow manually using a hack handheld flow probe. And when the flow is below those sensors, we did it the old fashioned way by filling up a graduated cylinder and timing it in replicates of three. As well, we also used uh, trail cameras so that we that took pictures three times a day at these sites so that we can see when the water stopped flowing, we could add zeros to our hydrographs to improve our hydrological estimates. Uh, sites without a defined inflow, uh, inflow is based on outflow when it's spill elevation and when all the basins were below spill elevation, um, we would use uh, the water depth with respect to the elevation storage curves to determine inflow. Uh, for water quality sampling with sites with no direct inflows, we, we deployed runoff trays. Uh, I think that was Kyle's favorite part of the project was helping me deploy those. We put these in a low swale between the, the crop and the wetland interface. And essentially those help steer the, the surface runoff water uh, from the uplands into a bottle. And we covered these with a sheet of wood between site visits. And for sites that had a tile inflow or a defined inflow channel or the outflow culverts, we would simply use a grab sample for collecting water quality. For the water quality sampling, in the fall, summer, in the fall, winter, and summer, we only collected periodically uh, during rain events and some base flow events. And springtime, when uh, we did uh, water sampling, were collected more intensely. Uh, we aimed for, if we could, once or twice a week between March 1st and May 31st. This is another gap in the literature right now, where most of your mass of nutrients comes in with higher flows. So if you can collect more water quality sampling at that time, you're going to have a more accurate estimate of your, of your nutrient loads. For the nutrient load calculations in the fall, winter, and summer, uh, the water come, like I said, water chemistry was collected for rain events, was used for rain events, and the water chem collected for base loads was used for base loads. But during the springtime and other periods of continuous flow, we use linear interpolation was used between periods when water sam 
samples were collected. And your daily nutrient load is simply calculated from multiplying your daily concentration by your uh, daily flow. Okay, going into some of the results now, the first thing I'm going to share is uh, just a one slide on precipitation. <clears throat> precipitation drives the amount of water going into your wetland, and that drives the amount of nutrients going into your wetland. So it's sort of important. So for the first year, we had a mean, uh, it was about, we, we received about uh, 1,053 millimeters of rain. So that was above average. In year two, we received about 924 millimeters of rain. So that was below average. This plot here shows the month on the x-axis. On the y-axis on your left is the monthly precipitation that lines up with the bars, and the cumulative precipitation on the right-hand side uh, lines up with the line. So year one is on the top and year two is on the bottom. I'm just going to quickly point out that we see in the fall for year one through October and November was much higher than year two. The winter for year, uh, year one was much higher in precipitation than year two. The spring in year one was a lot more higher precipitation than year two. And then both years were pretty much even with respect to the summer precipitation until you reached September, where at the very end of September for year two, the area of Ontario here received about 100, I think it was 107 millimeters over two and a half days. So that really pushed up the summer precipitation. So in year two, uh, we need to see that we had a very, uh, we didn't really have a wet summer, uh, but at the end that that rain event really kicked it up to, to uh, showing that this area did receive uh, more precipitation in the, in the summertime. So that's the background showing how we were, we really lucked out in monitoring these sites over two distinct hydrological years. So the precipitation directly relates to the inflow, of course, so this site, uh, this uh, graph, sorry, shows our eight sites on the x-axis, and the total inflow is on the is on the is on the y-axis. And year one is in red, year two is in lighter orange. So we see that these four sites with on the left-hand side, these are the sites with larger contributing areas. So in year one, these sites received far more inflow than in year two, and even the sites on the right that had smaller contributing areas also uh, nearly doubled the amount of inflow in year one compared to year two. All right, so I'm going to jump directly now to showing the, the data for the nutrient retention capacity. On the left side here, uh, we have our sites on the x-axis. On the y-axis is the nutrient retention capacity shown in kilograms per year. And so this site, this graph is for total phosphorus with year one in red and year two in green. So if we look at the sites for year one in red, we see that there's seven sites that are acting as nutrient total phosphorus uh, sinks and one site that's acting as a large total phosphorus source. In year two, uh, we see that there's Four, uh, six sites that are, are retaining total phosphorus on the landscape. And there's actually two sites this year. Site MO flipped from uh, a sink to a total phosphorus source. Now, just keep in mind uh, site MA for year one here and site KE for year two. Uh, there's a slide later on and I'll explain those differences. But when we look at these sites all together and we look at the yearly means, we find that year one has a total phosphorus, a mean total phosphorus retention capacity of 7.4 kilograms per hectare per year, plus or minus 6.4, that's the standard error. And in year two, the, the drier year uh, had a total phosphorus nutrient retention capacity of 16.1. So we put those years together and we find that these newly restored wetlands retain on average 11.7 kilograms per hectare per year. If there's if you're watching this presentation and there's really one thing that I would want you to remember from that is that it's this value that these wetlands retain 11.7 uh, kilograms per hectare of total phosphorus and that taken together these wetlands act as nutrient sinks and retain phosphorus on the landscape. This plot is the exact same, but it's not for total phosphorus, but this is for SRP or soluble reactive phosphorus. So this is that species of phosphorus that's uh, 
the most bioavailable to algae. And this is the species of phosphorus that's being more represented in the loads entering Lake Erie over the past two decades. Uh, so we see that in year one and year two, seven of the eight basins are retaining soluble reactive phosphorus. And there's one basin that's acting as a source. But when we look at all the other year one, we're, we get a mean of 3.4, year two, a mean of 6.1. And on average, we're retaining uh, 4.8 kilograms per hectare per year of soluble reactive phosphorus on the landscape with these uh, newly restored wetlands. <clears throat> I wanted to include one slide of, of, of nitrogen for uh, if there's any researchers who are interested in nitrogen. Uh, we do also have this data for nitrate, uh, ammonia, uh, TKN, and DKN as well in our final report. So we see here in year one, uh, all eight, eight basins are retaining total nitrogen. And in year two, uh, seven of the eight basins are retaining total nitrogen with one site here, <clears throat> MO, uh, really being a source of total nitrogen in year two. And that arose from two rain events in the summer. One was at the end of June and one was at the end of September, where we had very high uh, levels of nitrate being uh, kicked into the wetland and even higher nitrate levels uh, exiting this wetland. They were around the levels of 60 to 72 milligrams per liter. So those values, those concentrations are reported in the literature. So that does happen, but it doesn't happen too much on this landscape. But we did see this happen in the summer at site MO for uh, driving down that one, that one site. But on average, a year one, we see a total nitrogen retention capacity of 377. Year two, a little lower at 144, but on average for the all eight sites for two years, uh, they're retaining about 261 uh, kilograms of total nitrogen per hectare per, per year. <clears throat> so that's what these wetlands are doing for nutrient retention, but there's a question, so what's driving this phosphorus re retention? Um, so this plot here shows the eight sites. Uh, the black dots are from year one. The white dots are from year two. The total phosphorus inflow load is on the x-axis. It's just a logarith logarithmic scale. And the total phosphorus retention for each of those sites is plotted on the y-axis. On the y-axis. So we see that for both years, as you increase the total phosphorus load into your wetland, you're increasing your total phosphorus retention capacity. And this relationship is, is reported in the literature all the time. So we see that relationship here as well. Now, this black dot down here uh, for year one, that's site MA that was acting maybe as a bit of an outlier in year one. And this dot is site KE that was acting as a bit of an outlier potentially in year two. So essentially, if we just remove those and see what happens, those best fit lines uh, begin to agree with each other a lot more. So that's essentially, if you're ever wondering what is driving phosphorus retention in a wetland, it's the inflow, it's the inflow load of the nutrient. <clears throat> this slide, I'll just discuss some of the data that's reported in the literature and compare it to ours. Um, so for example, um, Mitch and Goslink in 2000, they looked at constructed wetlands in Illinois. And they showed that these wetlands retain uh, about four to 29 kilograms of total phosphorus per hectare per year. It's very typical in the literature and studying wetlands that you're gonna see a big range. Um, sometimes the wetlands will be small, sometimes they may be a bit bigger, the position on the landscape is gonna matter and the land use above that wetland is going to influence those results as well. So they found that range from four to 29. And of course, we find a mean of 11.7. So our what we found for total phosphorus retention really falls into line with what's reported in the literature. There was a large literature review done by Land et al. in 2016, where they looked at 63 wetland data that was reported in the literature. And they reported a medium, a median total phosphorus retention capacity of 6.3 kilograms per hectare per year. I'm using the median because 
some of their sites uh, were impacted by phosphorus in the uplands. Uh, so it's better, a little bit better for us to compare our values to their median. Uh, their, their mean was around 40. So our, this data really falls into line with what's being reported in, in the literature as well. The other thing I'm just going to touch upon is there is a metric called the phosphorus assimilation capacity or the PAC. And this is how much phosphorus a wetland can assimilate and lock away in one year. So Richardson and Keon in 1999 uh, reported a model in the literature that they developed from working up data from a North American wetland database. And they tested their model in the Everglades, which granted is a little bit of a different system than our wetlands. But they basically find that uh, they say that a freshwater wetland in North America should be able to assimilate 10 kilograms of, of phosphorus per hectare per year. And that's really close to what we're finding is being retained in our wetlands on, on average every year. So even though we're putting phosphorus into these wetlands every year and it's being retained, there's a really good chance that most of that is being assimilated and locked away so that the ecological integrity really isn't being hampered too much. All these basins that we studied are based on the project that uh, Owen alluded to as the, uh, from the Ontario Mallard Ecology Study. So one recommendation that came from that was to increase habitat for breeding pairs of mallards to increase settling rates. All these basins, they're very small basins. We're talking between 0.1 and 0.4 hectares, and they're also very shallow. In year one, we put out trail cameras to see if waterfowl were using these basins, just to simply get basic presence absence information. And we found pictures of waterfowl on all the basins. So waterfowl are using these basins <clears throat> because these basins are designed for waterfowl. They are not designed at all. They're not optimized whatsoever for water quality benefits, but yet this research that we did shows that not only are they uh, beneficial for waterfowl, but they're also providing society with some water quality benefits as well. I just wanna to touch on some recommendations from our report. Uh, one, it was recommended that Lake Erie Basin governments consider the development of domestic action plans that create wetland protection and restoration programs and policies that support the Lake Erie Action Plan in achieving pollution, pollutant reduction targets to improve water quality in Lake Erie. It's recommended that ecological modeling experts incorporate our data to advance nutrient processing models at the landscape scale to provide further information for watershed managers. And we're actually already doing this. We've already forwarded lots of our data from this project to Dr. Nadita Basu's lab at the University of Waterloo. Uh, Dr. Uh, Nadita Basu is a world leader in um, modeling small wetlands and their ability to retain nutrients in the landscape. <clears throat> And we also recommended to continue to adapt our engineering design to enhance the natural infra infrastructure values of our wetland restoration projects while still providing critical wetland habitat for waterfowl and other wetland dependent species for which they're intended. So to wrap this up, um, there is a, a lot of data that we generated, but some highlights is that we were lucky enough to re, uh, collect data over two distinct water years. We found a mean uh, total phosphorus retention capacity of 11.7 kilograms per hectare per year. These wetlands retain soluble reactive phosphorus at a rate of 4.8 kilograms per hectare per year. Um, our results are similar to what's reported in the literature. So it's, you don't wanna say it's nothing new, but this has never been done uh, on this landscape in Canada before. So that's really important. And you know the, the wildlife habitat that Ducks Unlimited Canada restores on the landscape also provides an important service for people. And in this case, which is the protection of fresh water. So with that, um, I'd like to thank everyone lending me their ear for uh, a little while. And it's really nice to be able to share this with everyone on uh, World Water Day. So with that, I'll pass the mic over to Kyle. Great, thanks so much, Brian. Uh, it was a really good presentation. Uh, just to touch real quick on, on those um, <laughs> runoff trays, I think <clears throat> it was really, you know, working with them in that, uh, you know, plus 30 degree heat and literally, you know, to touch on them, it was like feeling a seatbelt that's been sitting in a hot car all day. They were 
very, very warm and difficult to, <laughs> to install uh, in, you know, during the, uh, the setup time. But uh, again, um, thanks again. And, um, you know, through this work, the science has uh, long shown that wetlands are good at filtering out and processing nutrients. And uh, this new research confirms that wetlands are powerful for protecting the health of our lakes <clears throat> and the ability to enjoy them. The dual crises of climate change and biodiversity loss are at work across Canada and the United States, and we're racing to find nature-based solutions to help better understand the many roles in wetlands that, uh, many roles of wetlands and their benefits to communities, as well as their, uh, how this research along with other research by DUC, universities and other institutions are helping build the case for wetlands as natural infrastructure. I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Pascal Badiou, uh, research scientist for DUC's Institute for Wetland and Waterfowl Research. Uh, Pascal joined DUC's uh, Institute for Wetland and Waterfowl Research in 2006, focusing on the ecology of wetlands and large shallow lakes. Uh, in particular, the role wetland restoration and conservation can play in regulating water quality and quantity in agricultural landscapes of the Canadian prairies. <clears throat> He's also interested in how the interaction of multiple stressors such as invasive species, increased nutrient loading, pesticides, and, and climate change affect wetland ecosystems. Pascal has been conducting research to determine the importance of wetlands and carbon cycling and how these systems can be managed to mitigate against climate change, as well as uh, the use of constructed wetlands for the management of stormwater and treatment of sewage effluent to, to improve water quality at the watershed scale within urban environments. Pascal learned both his bachelor's of science, of environmental science and his PhD in wetland ecology at the University of Manitoba. Welcome, Pascal. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, hopefully you are now able to see my screen. Uh, so I'd like to start off by thanking everyone for having me here today. Thanks, Kyle. Uh, thanks for the introduction. And good morning. Uh, I am calling in today from Okamak Marsh, uh, which is where Ducks Unlimited Canada's national headquarters is located uh, near Stonewall, Manitoba. So the research that Brian just presented shows that small restored wetlands you know, punch well above their weight in terms of retaining nutrients. Conversely, we also know that losing these systems can have significant implications for water quantity, quality, where the loss of these small wetlands can dramatically alter the amount and timing of water and nutrient export at the watershed scale. And the slide I'm showing here is, is simply based on some modeling research that was conducted out of the University of Saskatchewan uh, by Dr. John Pomeroy looking at the Smith Creek watershed and applying the cold regions hydrologic model, which was specifically adapted to account for the role of these small wetlands uh, in the impact on prairie wetland, on prairie, on prairie watershed hydrology. And what that modeling found was that the historic loss of wetlands actually significantly increased uh, the 2011 flood peak, which was the flood of record for that region. It also demonstrated that ongoing wetland loss would have equally important impacts on increasing flood peaks into the future. Now, the tremendous amount of wetland loss that has been experienced in the southern settled areas of Canada has resulted in wetlands that acted historically as sinks for phosphorus essentially being converted to hotspots for phosphorus. And again, this has been highlighted by some of the, the research that we've conducted in, in Southern Manitoba and the Broughton's Creek watershed, um, where we monitored water flowing through drained wetlands and, and always found uh, excessively high nutrient levels, often five to three times the guidelines for hyperotrophic systems. Not only that, we also found that the sediments and soils in these drained wetlands uh, were promoting uh, essentially the export of biologically available phosphorus, again, which is the most important form of phosphorus um, for driving algal blooms in downstream aquatic ecosystems. You know, and this work is important because recent modeling uh, conducted by Dr. Genevieve Ali from the University of Guelph suggests that facilitating uh, the increased connectivity of these watersheds, both spatially and temporally, 
through wetland drainage is potentially resulting in more frequent and severe algal blooms in one of Canada's sickest lakes. And so understanding how wetland conservation and restoration regulates water quality will not only help us address water quality issues in some of our most threatened lakes, but also has the potential to help address climate change by reducing non-point source nutrient runoff, contributing to eutrophication. And that's important because we know eutrophication and climate change interact synergistically to increase greenhouse gas emissions from these systems. Now, to address these really important issues focused on water quality and climate change absolutely requires international cooperation. And the Ducks Unlimited group of organizations is well positioned to be a solution provider in this regard. And this is in fact highlighted by the two maps that I'm sharing here. The one on the, uh, the, one on the left um, demonstrating uh, Ducks Unlimited's priority landscapes uh, on the North American continent. And the one on the right um, highlighting international watersheds uh, that are often suffering from some of the most serious eutrophication issues and are tied to some of the most uh, threatened water bodies, again, in North America being Lake Erie and Lake Winnipeg. And so with that, um, I'm going to introduce Dr. Ellen Herbert to talk about some of the international research collaborations that we are involved with uh, across Canada and the US. And so Ellen is a, the Ecosystem Service Scientist at Ducks Unlimited uh, Incorporated and based out of their national headquarters in Memphis. She works as a member of DU's national and international science team to evaluate the outcomes of Ducks Unlimited's conservation work across the continent through a combination of field experimentation, numerical modeling, and data synthesis with a special emphasis on flow regulation, climate mitigation, and water quality improvement. Ellen received her BA in biology from Kenyon College and her PhD in environmental science from Indiana University, where she was a graduate research fellow for the National Science Foundation. Dr. Herbert completed her postdoctoral research at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. So please help me welcome Dr. Ellen Herbert. Hello um, and good morning. Thank you for uh, inviting us here from south of the border to participate in this World Water Day event. Well, as Pascal said, um, I'm based here in Memphis, Tennessee, the national headquarters for Ducks Unlimited Incorporated, sister organization of DU Canada. And as Pascal and Brian have said before me, uh, water quality is one of the most pressing issues of our time. And we can demonstrate that wetlands can be uh, important contributors to not only improving water quality, but also providing multiple co-benefits that say traditional water quality improvement technology does not. Um, of course, as our name suggests, DU Canada, DU Incorporated, and Ducks Limited in the United States uh, have worked together for the better part of a century to sustain migratory waterfowl populations, but like migratory birds, water does not really respect political boundaries. And as Pascal said, it's very important to work internationally on some of these um, watershed scale issues. So here on the US side of Lake Erie, the Lake Erie drainage basin, uh, the Maumee River, which is what's highlighted on this slide that flows into the Western Lake Erie Basin is a dominant contributor of, heart, of phosphorus that drives harmful algal blooms. Um, Don Scavia and others have done some really nice modeling work looking at different management scenarios to help control this phosphorus. And it very much in line what, with what Pascal and Brian have been telling us, um, one of the best management practices that can reduce phosphorus loads below target levels, so that's the red dashed line on the slide, is wetlands and buffers on 25% of high phosphorus watersheds. And if you look at all of the different types of practices that um, the authors of this study modeled, you can see that very few of them actually help meet target load reductions and wetlands are amongst those few. So this gives us quite a bit of hope that these become um, much more readily implemented best management practices to control uh, phosphorus flowing into Lake Erie. 
This is one of the reasons that DU Incorporated here in the US and DU Canada are both working on small wetland projects all around Lake Erie. So these are all the drainages delineated for Lake Erie. Um, those that are in warm colors, the browns, oranges, and pinks are the primary contributors um, to of nutrients to algal blooms and the ones that we will focus on most for water quality improvement. And the little black dots scattered all across the map are historic and current DU and DU Canada projects. Um, so this really gives us a big opportunity to study these wetlands. Building on Brian and Pascal's work at DU Canada, we're implementing a monitoring study here for small wetlands in the Western Lake Erie Basin, the Maumee River and the River Raisin. So those are the two basins to the far left of your screen in light orange and dark orange. Um, and in those basins, we will be pretty much repeating some of the same data collection uh, techniques that Brian implemented um, in, on the Canadian side of the border to um, measure nutrient retention and hydrologic functions of wetlands ranging in age from 10 to 30 years old. Uh, one of the reasons we're doing this sort of as a complement to the work done by Brian and Pascal in Canada is understanding not only how uh, some newer wetlands function, but how that function might change over time um, and how a nutrient reduction in wetlands is maintained in a landscape over decadal time scales. And this helps us plan for the future. Um, so here are some of those study sites in the River Raisin and the Maumee Basin drainage. Um, very similar small wetlands implemented in agricultural landscapes. The other part of the work that we're doing that really ties in internationally is taking uh, some of Brian's data and data from our new study, um, as well as dozens of other peer-reviewed studies um, to help inform international modeling studies around the entire Lake Erie Basin. So this modeling study is a collaboration between Nandita Basu's lab and Emily and her postdoctoral scholar, Emily Urie at the University of Waterloo, DU Canada, and DU Inc. here in the US with funding from the Sunshine Charitable Trust Foundation. Uh, using a framework developed for the United States by Dr. Basu's lab that calculates nutrient surplus, so the nutrients available for runoff, overlays that data with a wetland inventory, so wetlands existing on the landscape, and calculates both nutrient loads and nutrient removal functions of wetlands. This is where that field data comes in as very important to help calibrate these models. We are gonna be harmonizing phosphorus data and wetland data across both borders, which is harder than it seems, both countries having very different data sets, uh, and then develop estimates of the current potential removal of phosphorus by wetlands, uh, and some of that pre preliminary data is shown here. The phosphorus surplus in orange, wetland density in that aqua color, percent phosphorus removal in blue gray color, and then total phosphorus removal in pink. Uh, again, early preliminary data from this modeling study. And we will continue to work with this data towards modeling the potential for wetland restoration. So implementing hypothetical west re wetland restoration layers and using project cost data from DU Canada and the US to develop a return on investment model that tells us essentially what is the amount of money uh, that it costs to remove a pound of phosphorus via the implementation of wetlands over time. And that will help us really build a prioritization and targeting model. Uh, here I'm showing you some really neat work by the Upper Mississippi Great Lakes Joint Venture that overlays this type of information on project cost um, area and cropland and overlays that also with the distribution of breeding ducks, non-breeding ducks, and um, areas associated with human populations. So our ultimate goal here is not only to build this model of the return on investment of wetlands for phosphorus removal, but build a secondary decision support tool that will help us locate those wetlands in places that benefit people and wildlife simultaneously. So really, as Pascal said, building this case not only for a single function like nutrient improvement, but also the multiple benefits that society and wildlife can achieve through wetland restoration. The last couple of things I'm gonna share with you are examples of how this idea is already being implemented. 
So the state of Ohio, which is, encompasses the majority of the Maumee River watershed, um, has already invested quite a bit in programs to reduce phosphorus loads to Lake Erie, both through agricultural BMPs and then more recently through uh, wetland BMPs. So I want to note that the state has committed nearly $90 million to 83 wetland restoration projects that will treat nearly 100,000 acres worth of uh, runoff. Uh, DU is a partner in many of these projects. Uh, this is Androff Wetland uh, Restoration here in the little picture. But I also want to note, going back to the, the work that Brian and Pascal acknowledged, the state is also committing $4.3 million to establish an independent monitoring program that will allow the state to adaptively manage these wetlands and demonstrate their efficacy for phosphorus and other nutrient removal. DU is also working with the state of Michigan on a pilot wetland under Michigan's adaptive management plan to reduce phosphorus loading into Lake Erie. Again, this is very similar to what Brian was suggesting for Ontario, some of the rec recommendations that were made uh, as a result of their program. What we're now doing is working with several departments um, within the Michigan state government to identify and locate wetland potential wetland restoration sites that would be um, appropriate for restoring, intercepting tile drain flow or ditch flow from agricultural lands and treating that water as well as providing public recreation benefits. So here in the background, you can see the many hundreds of sites that we've identified as having good potential to do this. And we're currently in the process of narrowing down um, to a single pilot site, which again, will do the all important monitoring of mass reduction of phosphorus uh, to inform future site design and um, inform the efficacy of the program. Finally, I just wanted to share, as Brian acknowledged, wetlands aren't only a powerhouse for phosphorus retention, nitrogen also comes into play here. So um, looking at much bigger basin in the United States, uh, the Mississippi River watershed, which is also highly impaired with nutrients, I think one of the easiest visual patterns to spot here is that drained wetlands in the left panel, those, all those red areas, are very closely aligned with the geographies that have really high nitrogen surpluses or areas that are subject to high nitrogen runoff. Uh, and one of the other programs that DU in the United States helps implement is a program with the Iowa Department of Agricultural and Land Stewardship, again, building small wetlands to intercept runoff from agricultural landscapes. And the importance of science and measurement in all of this is, as you can see here on the figure on the right, that graphs the percent nitrate removal against the hydraulic loading rate, the amount of water coming into the site on a daily basis. That has become, that monitoring done by Bill Crumpton's lab at Iowa State University over decades has become a really important tool to establish precise engineering and design criteria to maximize the benefit of these wetlands. So as Brian and others are developing this data set for DU Canada, um, it becomes a really important tool, not only for demonstrating efficacy, but for developing design criteria that helps us get the biggest bang for our buck out of these systems. So these are just a few examples of how DU Incorporated in the US and DU Canada are leveraging wetlands as natural infrastructure to improve water quality and also to provide multiple benefits to communities and wildlife. Uh, I thank you for your time today. And yes, on behalf of all the speakers, I we look forward to lively question and answer. Great. Thanks so much, uh, Ellen, and, and thank you, Pascal, as well. Um, it's great to see the efforts um, uh, that are being performed on, on the other side of, uh, of the lake as well, and uh, pretty exciting, exciting stuff. Um, <clears throat> so it has been a pretty informative and interesting hour or so, uh, and we'd like to use the remaining time that we have to open things up for questions. Uh, so I'll do my best to ensure that we get through as many as we can with the time we have. Uh, should you have a question you'd like to direct to any of our speakers, please uh, raise your hand and we can call upon you. So if you look at your uh, at the screen at the bottom, 
Um, you can raise your hand by going into the reactions uh, tab that is um, kind of on the, on the uh, right of all the little buttons there. And there is the option to raise your hand. Uh, alternatively, uh, feel free to um, uh, type in your question within the chat box. In the meantime, I do have a question, and this is one that I'm going to direct towards Brian. And um, just to give a little bit of background too, while I was, um, I came in uh, with the project at the beginning of the second water year and got to spend uh, over a week in the field with Brian, uh, setting up some sites and, and kind of uh, learning uh, some aspects of the project. And I feel Brian did a really good job. I, I personally uh, haven't spent as much time uh, <laughs> with this, this um, uh, with water quality as he has and, and had some questions around soluble reactive phosphorus. And Brian, I'm wondering if you can um, maybe give an, a, like a good example. I think you used one with respect to uh, how SRP is used by algae using um, pizza as a good example for someone like me. <laughs> Would it be possible to uh, maybe share that if you could? Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. I, I didn't use it in this presentation because I you, it's always dangerous sometimes. But when we say that SRP, cellular reactive phosphorus, is the most bioavailable form, is because usually if 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 that phosphorus is say it's bound to uh, an organic compound, uh, algae actually have to create an enzyme and they have to cut it off and then incorporate that into their body. So they have to actually put out efforts to try to get that, that, that phosphorus when it's locked away. But when it's bound to nothing and it's just floating around them, it's really easy for them to incorporate that into their cell. So if you want to think about that yourself, if, uh, if we had pizza just floating around the air in front of us right now, uh, you would think that lots of us wouldn't really need to work because it'd be free food uh, and that uh, we'd have all these resources and with all that free pizza, maybe we'd have lots of kids um, so that's sort of the the idea where when you say soluble reactive phosphorus is bio bioavailable, uh, it's going to proliferate algae. It's it's bioavailable. It is free, 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 free energy for algae, and it's one of the reasons why we're seeing so many harmful algal blooms in our freshwater lakes. Great, thanks so much, Brian. I and the reason I asked that, I guess it's been a oh, about a year and a half, and that's still <laughs> one of the ones that just sticks out uh, in my head. So I I really thought that would be helpful. Um, we do have one coming from the group here, uh, a, a few that are starting to come in. <clears throat> and so uh, one question that's been asked here: What is the fate of phosphorus in a wetland, and does it eventually require harvesting? Kyle, can I touch that one? Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, if you want to take that one, Brian. Yeah. Well, as I was talking about in the discussion slide, is that when the fo when phosphorus is going into a wetland, wetlands have a certain ability to assimilate that phosphorus, and most of that phosphorus gets locked up in the sediments of of a wetland, and there's certain geochemical uh, processes that change that phosphorus into more a more solid stable forms that aren't going to be released into the into the water column uh, as well there's lots of biological interactions where there's going to be maybe uh, insects that are going to take up that are going to eat um, smaller bacteria or they're going to in they're, they're going to graze on on algal matter that will incorporate that phosphorus into their bodies and then they'll hatch and fly away removing that phosphorus so every when we talk about we, we, we talk about the phosphorus going into these wetlands, but we also want to always talk about how that, how much these wetlands can assimilate that phosphorus. And that's where that modeling came in, where it's, it's estimated that a uh, freshwater wetland in North America should be able to assimilate about 10 kilograms of total phosphorus per hectare per year. Now, if there is a wetland that is located on the landscape where it's just receiving a pile of phosphorus. Like say there's a uh, 0.2 hectare wetland and its contributing area can be like a hundred hectares. That wetland might not perform very well for retaining phosphorus over the long, over the long haul. 
it might become saturated and oversaturated and start releasing that phosphorus. Now that's not to say that that wetland is going to end up producing more phosphorus than it received in its lifetime. Um, that phosphorus would have just been restored for a period of time and then maybe it would be get to a point where it's saturated and it's kicking out more, more phosphorus in later years. But that's where some of the research comes in about wetland placements. And I think we're gonna learn a lot, a lot more about that in the coming years where we wanna maybe be, you know, our recommendation might end up being that we wanna be aware that that might happen to a very small wetland with a very large contributing area. And maybe there's management strategies that we can do to avoid that situation. But it's that phosphorus system relation capacity that goes along uh, in all these talks as well. Great, thanks so much, Brian. Um, maybe what I'll do, let's see. So we have, um, we've got a few more coming through. I feel uh, that kind of, that touched on um, another question that came in here um, about um, the capacity. And it's something that, you know, I guess it is uh, uh, something that we're learning more about. The, um, so we've got a few others, uh, Brian, maybe I'll just keep you on the hot, on the hot seat here for a second. Um, there's one here uh, related to the agronomy of uplands uh, feeding those eight wetlands. Uh, so there's a question about the crop rotations and what were the tillage practices um, and if nutrients were added in the rotations. So um, the person here who, um, and it's, it's Nick, uh, Nick from Strathroy, uh, had been at your presentation with the um, uh, <clears throat> SR, uh, sorry, the um, St. Clair Region Conservation Authority in, in 19. Uh, and, it, and the soil sampling on the fields was only a 10 meter transect, uh, not the complete field. Uh, so he's wondering, is that really representative of nutrient levels in the full field? Yeah, thanks for that, Nick. Um, so we wanted to have a, we, so we didn't include uh, the upland soil sampling in the final report for this project. We're not including that in any presentations and we're not including that in any publication we go forward. Um, the reason we did that is that there was, of course, there's that one site in this project that was a source of phosphorus, and not just a small source, but a pretty big source of phosphorus every year. And when we saw these values from this wetland, we were really baffled by why this wetland was so different from all the other ones. So one thing that we did was we took cores from the top five centimeters of the eight wetlands and we submitted those for uh, Olson phosphorus. And we just did a small little, um, couple of small grab samples uh, with an Oakfield core at some small transects just to get an idea of what was going on in the field. So we're, we were looking at these wetland basins as uh, just essentially what's coming in right at the inflow and what's going out at the outflow. And whatever is happening on the upland landscape is, uh, is not what we're touching upon for this project. Um, with respect to what the uh, what was the the chemical the nutrient inputs um, we had there was one landowner who was at the start of the project said that if we wanted that information just to call him up he'd provide it with us for us um, we didn't want to go there with any of the any of the landowners any field practices that were going on we weren't incorporating we're not modeling those with the wetlands um, we just viewed the uplands as a a working landscape of southwestern Ontario. Um, so if that's basically what, how I'll uh, address that, is, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, I, th I, I, I think, um, yeah, it does give some, some good context for it. Um, and, and, um, I guess with, with that in mind, uh, the, uh, so in some cases, so in the example for the MA site, uh, it was a source, uh, instead of a sink. And there's some questions about that with respect to uh, the case for that. Sure, I'll touch on that a little bit more. Sure. Sure. So what we found out from taking the, the core samples from the top five centimeters is that site MA is highly enriched in Olson phosphorus. Uh, all the other sites were around um, between 10 and I think a 10 and 12 uh, milligrams per kilogram and site MA was 
about seven to 10 times higher than all the other sites. So that's leading us to just consider that possibly site MA is involved in some sort of legacy phosphorus issue potentially. Maybe there is a whole bunch of phosphorus that came through that channel and built up over the, over the years. Um, we're not we're not too sure, but we can say for sure is that site MA had the highest total phosphorus concentrations in the wetland itself in the water, and site MA had by far the highest sediment. Olson phosphorus levels as well. Uh, if you're if you work in in phosphorus in, in the science of phosphorus, there's there's a thing called legacy phosphorus, where there's areas of of land that um, just through a variety of different practices, whatever they might be, uh, to this present day have very high levels of phosphorus. And those areas of land, uh, when precipitation hits it, will dissolve a lot of phosphorus into that water and that phosphorus will be carried downstream wherever that goes. So phosphor legacy phosphorus is an issue. And I'm not saying site MA is or isn't, but we do know that that site is definitely um, impacted more by phosphorus than the other sites. And that's not to say that, that there's anything wrong with that wetland. That wetland is full of life. Um, it's, uh, there's maybe a bit more algae in that, in that site than other sites. But um, it's uh, it's it can, it holds back water, which is a benefit. There's waterfowl that use it, so just with respect to water quality, that one's just not holding back any phosphorus. Great, thanks, uh, thanks, Brian. Um, <clears throat> and so what I'm going to do, I'm just going to pass this over. There's a question here for Ellen uh, with regard to one to two percent watershed area. And thanks, Ellen from Dave uh, Featherstone. Uh, with regard to one to two percent watershed area in wetlands. Are you looking at something the size of Mami or smaller sub? Uh, sorry, the size of Mami or smaller sub watersheds and catchments. Um, what is the scale of the watershed considered as part of the wetland percentage? Yeah, th those are much much smaller than the size of uh, of the Mami. Um, those are uh, much more closely related to things like. Um, you know, a couple farm fields, a thousand to two thousand acre small watershed or drainage sheds. So where we know the the tile drain surface and subsurface drainage is consolidating to a point which may or may not match with an actual topographic watershed. But yes, these are much much smaller. But you can imagine that that rule sort of can scale uh, across the watershed as well um, that you need you do need to have and there's there's some good work showing this in larger watersheds having a certain percentage of a watershed in receiving flow through wetlands is um, you know is a scalable thing but when we're designing and working and implementing these things they are uh, you know on the scale of one to a couple landowners and farm field operations. So. Very cool. Yeah, it's really exciting to see the the work that's um, you know happening on on uh, and in Ohio and and uh, on the other side of the uh, uh, the border. Um, and so it looks like uh, we've got a response uh, here, Brian, as well. Just just from what you're talking about a second ago, um, <clears throat> and it's about. Um, uh, so if, if it's uh, realistic to keep it at, at that point, um, uh, knowing that uh, the upland is important and the work that Dr. McRae has done at U of Waterloo shows that there is relationships between phosphorus levels in the soil and phosphorus movement. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, Nick said, I think it's very important to know what is upland. The work that Dr. McRae has done at the University of Waterloo shows that there is a relationship between phosphorus levels in the soil and phosphorus movement. Nick. Uh, absolutely, it's important. Um, but this project was designed to ask the question, how much phosphorus are wetlands retaining on the landscape? We didn't go to our funders saying that we wanted to build up a model and do relationships between how much phosphorus is in the soil upland uh, and relate that to what's going into our wetlands. And the one of the reasons why, just so you know why we didn't, is because we needed to go to some landowners and ask them if we could study their wetlands on their working landscape. And 
we didn't want to make it seem that we wanted to be poking our nose into what they're doing upland, their, 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 their soil practices, their crop practices. That is something that might have possibly turned people away saying, no, we don't want you to work on these wetlands. So that's, that, that's the reason. Doing that as well would have uh, it would have cost more money and more time. So it's not that it's not important. And we work with uh, um, uh, soil scientists at the University of Manitoba and we collaborate with them all the time. And that relationship is absolutely there, but simply we just didn't go there for this project to answer the question, how much phosphorus is retained in newly restored wetlands? So that's the only reason. Great. Well, thanks so much, Brian. Um, I just noticed here, so we're getting close to the end of the time, and um, uh, it looks like, uh, are there, is there anything else that uh, any of the speakers would like to add uh, before we, uh, we sign off here? And if not, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we have you know, come to the end of our time. And, and I want to thank everyone for sticking around for the questions uh, as well. And again, thank you to our uh, all of our special guests. Um, as I mentioned earlier today, the webinar has been recorded. Uh, please watch for an email in the next coming days with a link to that recording. We will also be sure to include a link uh, to the website where you can download a copy of the full research report. In the meantime, uh, should you have any further questions, please feel free to reach out to us uh, and once again, thanks to all of our presenters and our landowners and, um, and you know, Environment Canada and Climate Change uh, for making this, uh, this research possible. And take care, everyone, and be well. <laughs>